Act 1, Scene 5. Finally, we are introduced to Lady Macbeth, one of Shakespeare's most remarkable creations. At once malevolent and manipulative, but also tortured and complex, ambitious but also afraid. The scene opens with her reading a letter Macbeth has just sent her, telling us about all his adventures with the witches. As I stood wrapped in the wonder of it came missives from the king, who all hailed me Thane of Cawdor, by which title before these weird sisters saluted me, and referred me to the coming on of time with hail, king that shall be. What we notice immediately is that this is, whilst we might not call it a good marriage, at the very least an extremely close one. Macbeth confides utterly in her, and describes her here as his partner in greatness. Once she's finished the letter, which you can tell by how she switches from prose to blank verse, she starts out on a really marvellous soliloquy that gives us a fantastic introduction to her character. Glams thou art, and Cordor, and shall be what thou art promised. Yet do I fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition, but without the illness should attend it. What thou wouldst highly, that wouldst thou holily. Wouldst not play false, and yet wouldst wrongly win. Thou'dst have great glams, that which cries, thus thou must do if thou have it and that which rather thou dost fear to do than wishes to be undone. <gasps> she begins by explaining her fear that her husband is too full of the milk of human kindness to be able to do what he needs to do in order to become king. She then identifies a number of contrasts, contrasts between what her husband could achieve and the barriers that stand in his way. On the one hand, he could achieve great power if he was willing to be violent and ambitious, but on the other hand, he does not have an inherently evil character. He is reluctant to play false, even if he will gain a lot by doing so. Each of these contrasts can be identified by the repeated phrase, thou wouldst, meaning you could be, showing what he could achieve, but inevitably followed by the word but, contrasting that possibility with the barriers of personality that stand in his way. He could be great. He is, as she says, not without ambition, but at the same time he is reluctant to play false, to play dirty in order to rise up the ladder. Though he does want to achieve highly, he wants to achieve it holily, in a holy or moral way. These contrasts in Lady Macbeth's speech are further emphasized by Shakespeare's wonderful use of wordplay, rhyming some of these opposites, like highly and holily, for example, and also alliterating others in the example of wouldst wrongly win. Part of the effect of this is that this speech is a real mouthful to say. All of the internal rhymes and other sound techniques make this speech frankly one of the hardest to pronounce in Shakespeare, with the inevitable effect that it is also always one performed quite slowly. Without even a stage direction, Shakespeare has forced his actor to slow down and perform this speech with an extremely serious, thoughtful tone, emphasizing how deeply and carefully Lady Macbeth is thinking through these questions about her husband. Now the plot thickens. A messenger arrives to tell Lady Macbeth that Duncan will be staying at their castle tonight. In fact, he will be arriving in just a few hours. Her husband is only a few hours ahead of him. The lady must act quickly, and she does. She gives the second incredible speech of this scene. She decides, if her husband lacks the blackness of soul to murder the king, she must make her own soul twice as black to compensate. The raven himself is horse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan. By the raven, she means the messenger who has announced Duncan's impending arrival. She's effectively saying that because the messenger is out of breath due to the speed at which he's brought this message, he sounds croaky like a raven, thereby forming a gloomy omen of Duncan's impending death. Now, from here, we have three sentences, each one beginning with the word come a wonderful double entendre, since she is simultaneously summoning the spirits of darkness to aid her in her murderous plans, but also, in a way, telling Duncan to come, to come forth and meet his doom. Come, you spirits, that tend on mortal thoughts. Unsex me here, 
and fill me from the crown to the toe. Top full of direst cruelty. This first of the come sentences develops our emerging theme of gender, of what it means to be a man. In Lady Macbeth's eyes, her husband is not manly enough to do the deed, so she must unsex herself, strip herself of her own femininity and become the man her husband isn't, in order to bring the prophecy into fulfilment. The metaphor, make thick my blood, only adds to this, since thin blood in this time was associated with both femininity and cowardice especially in these days when it was commonly understood that women were biologically wired to be more caring and remorseful than men. Hence this highly biological extension of that metaphor. She thinks this thickened blood will stop up and block her womanly capacity for kindness. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers. Again, Lady Macbeth calls on these dark spirits to enact violence against her own femininity, to exchange her nurturing milk for bitter bile, the bodily fluid considered in these times to be the opposite of the sustaining power of a mother's milk. Come, thick night, and pour thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry hold. It is hard to tell to whom this knife is directed. What is this wound she is talking about? Is she talking about the wound she plans to give Duncan through her husband? Or is she talking about the wound she is giving to herself by doing this, cutting out her own femininity such that she might be able to carry out these plans? Whatever it is, she is appalled by it. So like Macbeth in the previous scene, who commands his eyes not to gaze upon his hands so that they might not be witness to the murder, she tells night to wrap itself around her so that she also might not be able to see what she is going to do. Now Macbeth enters, and she immediately changes. Note the ritualistic quality of all that she has just described. Almost like the witches, she seems to be summoning something, doing some kind of metaphorical spellcraft that will bring the future into being. But now with the entrance of her husband, she snaps out of it, and talks to him clearly and carefully. Duncan comes here tonight. And when goes hence? Tomorrow, as he purposes. Oh, never shall sun that morrow see. This is a wonderful, sharp exchange. Duncan will come here tonight, says Macbeth. When will he go? asks the lady. Tomorrow, replies Macbeth, or never, replies the lady. Tomorrow may not come for Duncan, but she says it so quickly it's almost as if Macbeth misses it, or only partly gets it. It's more as if she's planting a suggestion in his mind rather than talking seriously. She tells him, therefore, to be like a serpent, to hide his true desires from the rest of the world in much the same way as Macbeth described in his Act 1, Scene 4 speech. The scene is rushed, deliberately so, they must go and receive Duncan, but we see their closeness as a couple revealed through the fact that, though they have barely spoken and have not even mentioned the word murder or spoken about any of this stuff directly, they both seem to be on exactly the same page. We will speak further, says Macbeth, and the two of them leave to receive the king. <laughs> 